Good afternoon from Brussels and a warm welcome to our 600 plus registered participants from around the world and our viewers on YouTube to this webinar hosted by SEPS. My name is Stephen Lockmans, I'm the Director of Research at SEPS and I will be moderating today's debate, which is devoted to a better understanding of the new EU-China Investment Agreement or short CHI. Many were quick to herald or criticize the in principle conclusion of negotiations on the new EU-China investment deal on the 30th of December, without however having even seen the full text of the agreement. This, I think it is fair to say, has led to a somewhat overheated debate in the first half of January. Now, last Friday, January 22nd, the text was published online by the European Commission, even if in an unscrubbed version, which is still liable to modification and additions. Annexes detailing uh, specific sectors covered by the agreement will be published in February. We see also the, the, the rendezvous clause on investment protection and investment dispute settlement, uh, with, which has a two year time horizon after signature of the agreement. Now at SEPS, we have been following the, the making of process uh, much longer than the, than the last few months with regular publications by our trade experts, Ben Yan Hu, Jacques Pelkmans, and many others. We've held back on publishing an analysis on the CHI until we've had a deeper dive. And so this webinar is intended, first and foremost, to enhance, as I said, our understanding of the EU-China investment agreement. I think we're particularly interested in learning whether one, the EU's negotiation objectives of market access, fair competition, sustainable development, to name but a few, have been achieved. Two, what tangible benefits would result from deeper and broader market access in China, as well as for Chinese investments into the EU. Three, uh, whether the criticisms about value-based trade relations with China, the enforcement mechanisms agreed to, and the timing of the in-principle conclusion of the deal three weeks before the Biden administration took office, whether those criticisms hold water. And fourth, finally, whether the CHI is a litmus test for the EU's open strategic autonomy. Is it perhaps a harbinger of a change in the EU's trade policy? Now, who better to help us in this analysis than Sabine Weyand, Director General of DG Trade of the European Commission, point woman uh, on the CHI, and in the past co-negotiator for TTIP, CETA, in Brexit negotiations, well, I could go on. Also on the call, Reinhard Bütiköfer, member of the European Parliament for the German Green Party and co-chair of the Interparliamentary Alliance on China, and Noah Barkin, managing editor with Rhodium Group's China Practice and a senior visiting fellow in the Asia program of GMF based in Berlin. Now, as for the rules of the game for the next hour, Sabine Weyand will first introduce the CHI in 10 ish minutes, an impossible task, but we'll see how that goes. After which, Mr. Butikofer and Barkin will each take around seven minutes to offer their comments. I will use the two minute V sign to indicate that you are nearing the end of the time allotted to you and a first sign to a signal that, a fist sign, I should say, to signal that the time is up. Um, we will then have around 30 minutes for debate. Uh, participants can enter their questions in the Q&A section of Zoom, not in the chat or shout box. Um, that Q&A section will be curated by SEPS uh, with clusters of questions being relayed to me. And to that end, you can also upvote questions that you like. And please make sure to properly identify yourself and address them to one of the speakers. Finally, we will reserve the last five minutes of this hour for closing statements going in reverse order. And to be sure, as I mentioned, this is a, an on-record conversation. So with that, Dr. Vejant, dear Sabine, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen, and thank you very much uh, to SEPS uh, for hosting this event. And I'm indeed very happy uh, to brief you about where we are um, in relation to uh, the CHI, uh, the investment agreement with China, but also in relation to our wider China strategy and how CHI fits into our overall approach towards China. 
Um, so as uh, Stephen has explained, uh, on the 30th of December, we uh, concluded in principle the negotiations of CHI, which means that uh, in the assessment of the Commission, um, and that was shared by the member states uh, uh, that we consulted ahead of this conclusion, we had achieved the, the negotiating objectives uh, for this investment agreement. So what happens next is indeed that we are uh, proposing, preparing uh, the package for finalization. Um, and we will then uh, uh, prepare it for the political deliberation by the Council uh, and by the European Parliament. Um, we have indeed published last Friday the text of the body of the agreement um, in an unscrubbed form, um, which may make uh, the reading a little bit more difficult because the numbering doesn't fit, etc. Uh, but just to reassure you, the text that is published is subject only to legal scrubbing, not to revision and additions. What is still missing and what will come in February is indeed uh, the schedules uh, of market access offers, uh, because once the negotiations are concluded, these still need to be consulted with the member states in order to make sure that all reservations which are at member state level here are reflected correctly. So then this will be published in February. And then we will start the legal scrubbing, but which is really just a legal scrubbing that we have to do uh, with the Chinese side. So we foresee that um, we would be able to propose this to the other institutions uh, for adoption uh, and consent respectively towards the end of this year. Um, and we need to use the time in between to also advance the other elements of our China strategy. Because, um, as you know, the EU uh, is viewing China as at the same time a negotiating partner, an economic competitor and a systemic rival. And that means that there is not one instrument that on its own can deal with all uh, the challenges that uh, a system like China, uh, which is very different in political and socio-economic uh, terms from ours, uh, raises for us. So what is the basic uh, uh, content of CHI and the rationale? It's a sui generis investment agreement. It is not an investment protection agreement. It is not a free trade agreement. It is sui generis in the sense that it couples um, market access leveling the playing field and sustainable development. Part of the reason for that is that a comprehensive free trade agreement of the nature that the EU uh, has recently concluded and is negotiating with others is not available for a country like China. The challenges are too high. There's no chance that you would be able to conclude an FTA uh, uh, with uh, China that would work for, for, the, for the EU. Hence the idea to use uh, the investment agreement for rebalancing a very unbalanced relationship. So what uh, Kai is doing is that it addresses the significant market access barriers that our investors face and the fact that they are not um, competing on a level playing field once they are in the market. Um, and this is compared to the situation in the EU, uh, where the market is basically open, and we have bound that openness in the WTO. China's bindings stem from the time when it joined the WTO in 2001. And since then, it has engaged in autonomous liberalization, but it has never bound that. And so part of the advantage in terms of market access is that we bind the autonomous uh, opening that China has undertaken, but we also create new uh, market access opportunities, um, which uh, uh, China has never, never entered into, uh, in particular in areas of key interest for the EU, um, like manufacturing, half of our FDA in China is in manufacturing, but also in private healthcare, cloud services, air transport services, um, and we have built in, in uh, a ratcheting clause where further openings by China would automatically accrue to us. With regard to the level playing field, CHI imposes disciplines on state-owned enterprises, rules against forced technology transfers, 
as well uh, as uh, uh, it injects further transparency into subsidies, uh, complementing rules uh, that we have in the WTO. It also front loads uh, and deepens rules on licensing we are currently negotiating in the WTO. And it tackles barriers uh, such as access to standard setting uh, bodies and technical committees. Importantly, CHI also promotes our sustainability objectives. For the first time, China has agreed to solid provisions on sustainable development, including in relation to climate and environment, such as implementation of the Paris Agreement, as well as corporate social responsibility and labor, including the commitment uh, to ratify LO core conventions, notably on forced labor. And no doubt we will come back to that uh, with more detail uh, in the discussion. Now, does China, and here I pick up the question raised by Stephen in the beginning, does China level the playing field and close the gap uh, in our respective openness of the markets? No, but it makes a decisive progress to that. So the question in evaluating the achievements of, uh, of, uh, uh, of CHI is we need to compare it to other agreements. We need to compare it to what China has already committed to in the WTO. We need to look at what has happened in RCEP. And we need to look at uh, what has happened in the US-China phase one deal. And in all respects, CHI advances market opening Leveling, uh, levels the playing field and enhances sustainable development uh, compared to all these elements. Notably on sustainable development, China has not entered into any uh, uh, um, commitments of that sort in, in any agreement. Second point after this uh, summary of the agreement is I wanted to refer to the systemic value of CHI. The commitments that the Chinese have made are available to all trading partners on the basis of the most favored nation principle, as far as services are concerned. Uh, so everyone benefits from that. Then uh, we have indeed uh, systemic issues such as state-owned enterprises, subsidies, sustainability, which are uh, 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 issues that help us tackle the distortions that come from the Chinese system. And they provide impetus for further cooperation with the US and Japan in the trilateral uh, and with other like-minded countries. The rules tackling uh, forced technology transfers, uh, which are both in CHI and in the US-China phase one agreement, are the fruit of our trilateral work and are a good example of that. And uh, what we have uh, done in CHI on competitive neutrality should serve as a springboard for further work in the WTO. So um, we see this as uh, an element in our China strategy that complements also our multilateral uh, approaches and plurilateral approaches with other partners. But of course, it also needs to be seen against the backdrop of our independent uh, autonomous uh, measures, which we are taking, are taking and have taken in order to uh, safeguard our security, FDI screening, the 5G toolbox, but also the work on disinformation. Uh, autonomous instruments we use to tackle economic distortions in the EU market through trade defense action. Uh, the foreign subsidies instrument we will present uh, in a few months. Uh, and of course, we will continue to use uh, the WTO dispute settlement, hopefully being able to cooperate with the new US administration in this respect. Then, of course, we also want to open up uh, the Chinese market through uh, leverage that we hope to create with the uh, international procurement instrument. And here I have high hopes for the Portuguese presidency to move this forward. And in order to project our European values, we have, of course, the global human rights instrument, where the listing of entities will start now. And we are in contact uh, with member states who are in charge of this listing. Uh, and many of them uh, indeed see a need to use uh, this also to address situations in China. We have the due diligence legislation, which we will present in June and where forced labor will be a very important element. Um, and of course, we are looking at what can we do in the meantime until that legislation comes on stream. Can we already give guidance to our companies on what they need to do in order to live up to international due diligence obligations that already exist through the OECD, et cetera. 
So, um, to conclude, Kai is an important uh, building block, but one building block of a wider China strategy. And we look forward to engaging with other partners, first and foremost with the US now, uh, but also with uh, trusted partners like Japan and other like-minded countries with whom we have been working in order uh, to move things forward in the interest of free and fair trade. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sabine. Um, it's a tour de force to try and uh, encompass all the elements uh, in just 10 minutes. But um, thank you for that uh, wide overview and, and the accents that you have placed uh, on it. I mean, one of the partners of the Commission ultimately in this uh, process will have to be the European Parliament. I mean, I'm not out of the woods yet whether this will be um, an exclusive competence only uh, affair or, or indeed uh, mixed agreement, but uh, in any case, uh, the European Parliament and with uh, Rainer Bütikofer, who's followed this process uh, for a long time um, and issued a briefing also, a briefing note on, on Monday um, in this respect, um, criticism has already been, been floated. So uh, Rainer, perhaps we can hear from you now. Well, thank you first of all to SEPS for organizing this and thanks for having me on. Um, I would like to start my contribution by tipping my hat to the Commission for the hard work they have invested in this ne these negotiations, even though I uh, am not uh, full of too many compliments uh, for the result. Uh, but let me start with the positive side. Uh, I think it um, does indeed, the deal does indeed offer some improvements to European industry. I find those mainly in the field of market access. Some of the concessions China makes are recycled ones. They reap benefits that would fall into our lap anyhow under China's foreign investment law. Some achievements are conditioned in different ways, including geographically. Some are counterbalanced by other regulatory measures like localization measures for banks. And there is also, I saw already a discussion in China that the dropping of some JV requirements may not materialize because the government has other tools to make JVs an option that can hardly be refused. Still, in summing it all up, there are improvements regarding market access. I'm afraid though, that at least in the automotive sector, they might pertain more to MNCs than to SMEs. I call this the Gulliver goes to China risk. It may have far-reaching industrial policy consequences for Europe. Maybe we can discuss that later. On the level playing field issues, which constitute our second basket, I'm less good humored. We did not get anything on procurement. We did not get competitive neutrality. We did not get full reciprocity. Uh, ICS or ISDS is still up for negotiation. The SOA disciplines, the for, uh, forced um, tra tech transfer protections and the additional transparency rules that commission negotiated are effectively only as strong as the conflict resolution mechanism is. And they are tempted to quote a Abraham Lincoln. It's as weak as a soup made from the shadow of a pigeon that died of starvation. Why is it weak? Because it depends on goodwill from either side. What can force China to contribute such goodwill if they are, for instance, unhappy with our unilateral regulation on investment screening, IPI, anti-subsidy protections, and so on? They presently demonstrate in the Australian case how they do implement bilateral agreements. The weakest part is the sustainability chapter. The language on climate obliges China to do what they pledged in Paris five years ago, why would this be an achievement, particularly as China's NDC is pretty unambitious? On CSR, I must say, I do not even understand what China's vague promise really means in a country that has no free trade unions, no freedom of speech, and an almighty communist party that, as they say, leads everything. Finally, labor protections. This pertains to ILO core norms 29 and 105, 87 and 98. I find it completely unacceptable how commission has misrepresented this part of the deal. They agreed non-binding language and still boasted that it gives us 
quote, leverage to eradicate, end of quote, forced labor in China. That is taken literally from a tweet of President uh, von der Leyen. How do I know that the language is so weak? We were just told in the Korean case that it is. Let's not pretend. The EU caved here. And this is exactly the one decisive point where our trade interests and our values intersect. If we're happy with the statement of EU Ambassador Xiaopui that he recently made at a press conference in Beijing that trade has nothing to do with human rights, then maybe we're fine. I strongly disagree with that. Compartmentalization of our relations with a systemic rival China will not work because they do not compartmentalize. They have an all out struggle on all fronts approach. Of course, we should try to cooperate, but we need to learn better how to cooperate with a systemic rival. And finally, if I have one more minute, a few geopolitical arguments. I believe as Dmitry Trenin from Carnegie wrote that geoeconomics now follows geopolitics, not the other way around. Maybe unpleasant for the EU and certainly unpleasant for Germany, but that is reality. And in this world, it has been wrong to finalize the deal just three weeks before US President Biden came into office. I don't mean to say we should have asked him for his okay. We do our own EU decisions, obviously. But to do this deal now has sent a negative signal to DC and a wrong one to Beijing. Is it really more important for the EU to demonstrate to Washington that we cherish strategic autonomy than to demonstrate to Beijing that the transatlantic access is back? Unfortunately, the EU, I think, has made a strategic mistake there. We have to correct it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Butikofer. I'm sure um, Sabine Vaillant will want to react to, to those points. So we'll cycle back, but uh, first, Noah Barkin. Well, thanks, Stephen, and thanks to SEPS for inviting me. Um, I don't think an investment agreement has ever generated as much interest and debate before, uh, at least not in my, in my experience. And, and, and so I think, um, you know, the more open discussions like this that we have, the better. Uh, and I, I commend Sabina for, for explaining the agreement and, and also putting herself in the firing, firing line like this. Um, I am not all doom and gloom about this agreement. I'm gonna start on a positive note like, like Reinhardt did. Um, I, I recognize that on the issue of market access, it is clearly an asymmetric deal that's in Europe's favor. Uh, I don't think it dooms transatlantic cooperation on China. Uh, and I also realize that you are not going to end what is happening in Xinjiang with an investment agreement. Um, but I do have some concerns about the deal, uh, which are more about the context than the content. And I wanted to, to lay those out for everyone. Uh, the first concern is about how the deal was done. The, the, the scramble to conclude this in the final days of 2020. Um, my understanding, and, and, and Sabina, please tell me if I'm wrong, is that member states were told essentially it's now or never because the Chinese side wants to get this done before the German presidency is over and before Biden comes into office. Uh, and I'm not sure this, this sort of end of year scramble ultimately brings Europe closer together on, on China, which, which is ob obviously very important. Um, I would not argue with the idea that EU negotiators got the, the best deal that they could. Uh, they clearly fulfilled their mandate or, or the, the, the lion's share of what was asked of them. Um, but I would have liked to have seen a more public, uh, more robust public defense of the deal, an explanation from the political leaders who drove the process above all uh, Angela Merkel, uh, why it makes sense from a geopolitical, uh, not just an economic point of view. Um, I do think, and I'm echoing Reinhardt here to a certain degree, I do think the contents of the deal were oversold a little bit in the initial phase. Uh, I'm not sure the EU is, is, is spreading its values here. 
uh, and I'm not sure what, based on what I've seen, that one can classify the market gains as a real, a real game changer. Although clearly there is, there is progress there. Um, the second problem that I see has to do with the timing. Uh, weeks before Biden comes into office, obviously uh, Reinhardt touched on this, uh, but I think more importantly, uh, after a year of very unsettling uh, behavior uh, by the Chinese government, not only the security crackdown in Hong Kong, uh, what's happening in Xinjiang, uh, the treatment of countries like Australia and India, uh, but also here in Europe, the mass diplomacy, the wolf warrior threats, um, you know, uh, China's foreign minister came through Europe uh, on a tour in, in August uh, and threatened, um, uh, issued a public threat while he was here against the president of the Czech Senate for visiting Taiwan. Um, we've seen disinformation from Beijing on the origins of the pandemic and resistance to international attempts to get to the bottom of the initial outbreak. Um, so uh, I just want, wanted to highlight those issues. Uh, I, I think there's also an argument that the agreement is at odds with the thrust of China's current economic policies at home. Uh, it's pushed for self-reliance, uh, a greater role for the party and the state in the economy. Uh, if you talk with European companies these days, uh, they say they are under increasing pressure to show that they are Chinese and not foreign. Um, private companies, including homegrown Chinese firms, are increasingly subject to uh, party and state controls. So I think on a number of levels, there are reasons to question whether this is the right time to give China's leadership a, uh, a geopolitical victory of this kind. Uh, and, and that brings me to my last point. Um, I think the biggest issue for me is the geopolitical signal that it sends. Uh, Commission President Ursula von der Leyen came into office uh, just over a year ago, promising a geopolitical commission. Um, this agreement secures benefits for European firms uh, in, a, in a small number of sectors and countries, uh, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but if you see China as a major strategic challenge, as the commission itself says in its recent uh, transatlantic agenda paper, uh, then I think you need to, to think bigger uh, and you need to give the Biden administration a, a chance. Um, we've heard from EU officials in recent weeks that the deal is not at odds with the push for transatlantic cooperation on China. And Sabina just made the, these points uh, uh, in, in her remarks. Um, Trump did his phase one deal that this is strategic autonomy in action. Uh, but I think the main message that this agreement sends is that Europe will remain strategically flexible, that it will continue, in the, uh, as, as Reinhardt said, to compartmentalize in its relationship with Beijing, um, separating economic interests from broader strategic aims. And um, because of this, I fear it does risk sucking some of the momentum out of this push for multilateral cooperation on China. Uh, it's important to note that this is something that European, European officials said throughout the Trump years that they desperately needed the, the transatlantic cooperation on China. Um, now, as I said earlier, I, I, I don't think it dooms transatlantic cooperation or international cooperation on China, but it does sow some doubts about where Europe stands on this uh, strategic challenge. So I will end it there and pass it back to you, Stephen. Thank you very much, um, Noah. Well, um, I'm glad uh, that there is a, a common feeling that the market access part of the agreement um, looks very good, even if there are some aspects uh, that, that are still noted um, are up for criticism. I think at this point, it is, it, it is only fair uh, to, to give uh, Sabine Veyant um, a right of rebuttal um, before we dive into the questions which are still coming in. So Sabine. Thank you very much, uh, very briefly, because I don't want to take too much time away from the audience. But um, I, I was struck by some of the remarks here. Uh, let me first on the content of the agreement. Um, Mr. Butikofer seems to say at the same time, China cannot be trusted to implement what they commit to, and at the same time criticize the agreement because it only secures what China has already done. I think we have much less confidence in China not rolling back its current openness. 
And actually, that's what we've seen, these tendencies, especially in the last few years. So there is value in, in, in basically locking in the autonomous liberalization made for the last 20 years. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the US did not do that with their phase one deal. So we had to do it here. And by the way, it is not just for the benefit of EU companies. All benefits in the services sector are available to all trading partners on the basis of the most favored nation clause. I think that is a very important element. Uh, I also think that you are too dismissive of the uh, level uh, playing field provisions. And again, what is your yardstick? Is that an ideal world where we transform miraculously through an investment agreement, China into a liberal democracy and open market economy? Or should we use as a yardstick to decide whether the EU has gotten the best it could, what, has, what China has conceded in other contexts? On what do you base the assumption that we would have been able to negotiate something totally different and much further going uh, than the US was able to reach after having put uh, several hundreds percent of tariffs on billions of Chinese imports. So, you know, look at what we've done. We've decided to use our leverage, which is the openness of the EU market, uh, 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 the existing openness of the EU market, in exchange for commitments that benefit other players as well, and which strengthen rulemaking that we now have to develop plurilaterally and multilaterally. Where I really disagree is on uh, the sustainability provisions uh, being weak. Um, and we have had very difficult discussions with the Chinese because they didn't like the transparency. And they said, we have seen how you interpret uh, these provisions in the Korea case. And the Korea case has basically said, sustained and continuous efforts towards ratification has a meaning and it has to lead to ratification. Uh, and this means you cannot just kick the can down the road. And I think the European Parliament and member states will certainly use the time we have until the conclusion, the formal adoption of the agreement, in order to see whether there is progress that is up to the standard of sustained and continuous efforts towards ratification. Uh, of course, if you think that a sustainability chapter would introduce freedom of speech in China, that doesn't work. But uh, we've had that discussion, Mr. Butikofa, and we agreed that while we cannot have a regime change in China through a trade or investment agreement, we can also say to the Chinese, forced labor is not part of your model. That was exactly what we did after discussions with parliamentarians, after discussions with the member states. We went back to the Chinese and we said, we need the full commitment on forced labor conventions. And there's another element of the Korea ruling I would invite you to look at, and that is that the panel said that even without ratification, Korea, and the same applies to China, is bound by the principles of the ILO and the Centenary Declaration. And we have other language, so there is already a commitment against forced labor. Now, we have to intelligently use that and work with the Chinese and say, if you want to have a ratification of this agreement in Europe, Something has to happen between now and when the vote comes. So that is what the, the, the business we are in. On the geopolitical uh, signal, um, as I said, we have been very transparent with the member states and with the parliament on the progress of the negotiations. We would not have been able to conclude these negotiations if in the beginning of December, the member states had not accepted that we now had to put the final touches to our offer on energy, which was essential renewable energy, which was essential to conclude the negotiations. They could have prevented us from concluding if they hadn't wanted that by not agreeing to uh, this offer. Uh, so I would say that the, these negotiations have brought the member states together behind the strategy we have of 2019, which is a very uh, sophisticated and complex uh, strategy. Um, and as regards the US, we don't know at this stage what the China policy of the Biden administration will be. We have reached out before we did the final uh, conclusion of the negotiations to the transition team and said, we are happy to brief you about the state of play and what is in the, in the agreement. Uh, but the transition team is prevented 
uh, from engaging uh, with foreign officials, and that's why they refused. Uh, we had offered briefings to people around the, 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 the transition team, but that didn't work either. I have full understanding of that, but the signal was sent uh, that we are ready to engage. And I think that CHI strengthens the contribution that the EU brings to the table. Um, and to come back to this issue of strategic autonomy, I don't think it's the, the EU's policy is not to distinguish itself as a matter of principle from the US or others or whatever. But we stand up for our own interests and we project our values in the way we think works best. And that means that we do not rely on others to negotiate for us. And we have seen that the US-China phase one deal, which will be around for quite a while, is to the detriment of the EU. Now, I do, not uh, I do not underestimate the huge challenge we have to bind China into a rules-based system. But we don't have an alternative to that. There is no alternative to engagement. We need to leverage, use all the leverage we have to do that, but there's no alternative to engagement. And that is what we, uh, 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 what we need to do here. CHI is one element uh, which uh, strengthens us, but it is by no means uh, the, the, the end of the story, on the contrary. So we are also active to develop all our autonomous measures to deal with our security, uh, to deal with distortions brought by China, uh, to deal with human rights violations. All these are processes which are active as well. By the way, the US has often complained that they would have to do all the heavy lifting and that the EU was not bringing enough to the table to cooperate on China. And I think uh, Kai shows that we are ready to bring things to the table. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sabina, also for uh, answering in a way some of the questions which have, have been uh, coming in to the Q&A section um, and, and especially those, those last remarks, I think, on strategic autonomy and uh, transatlantic collaboration um, have been uh, a matter of concern for, for a number of our uh, participants. Uh, Stuart Lau from Politico, Paul von Doren, former, former head of EU delegation, uh, Massimo de Femia and others, that they essentially ask um, whether the EU will take the lead also in, in, in forging this uh, strategic collaboration on, uh, on China policy, would it rather wait uh, for the Biden administration to uh, to now come up with that. Perhaps that's a quick follow-up to, to what you just said. Um, we have already set out our stall on transatlantic cooperation, including on China, in our communication uh, that was published at the beginning of December. So um, we have to strike a fine balance here. We have set out a menu of where we see a need and scope for close transatlantic cooperation. And a lot of the challenges uh, uh, relate uh, to China, whether that is on technology, and we have offered a trade and technology council to the US administration, where we would look at exactly these issues uh, that, are, that are sensitive. Um, and uh, uh, we uh, also have to recognize that the Biden administration is very much focused on domestic uh, uh, policies and politics at the moment. So we will have to see how, how uh, quickly uh, they will be able to take up that offer, uh, but uh, uh, it is out there. So we are not waiting for them to take the initiative. We have taken the initiative uh, even before uh, the president-elect became the president. Yeah, thank you. A few other questions of, of clarification. Uh, essentially, we've been upvoted by, by several people in our Q&A section relates to the so generous nature of this investment agreement, as you started by saying, uh, and its relationship um, and future also of the 26 existing um, EU member states bilateral investment treaties uh, with China with regard uh, to CHI um, and possibly, you know, the envisaged uh, agreement on investor uh, dispute settlement. What, what that, that being said, what, what is also the, the confidence level that this, uh, this last agreement, or the CHI itself, uh, will be an EU-only agreement uh, and not a mixed one? Um, yes, indeed. Uh, there is one element uh, on which negotiations continue, and that is the invest investment protection agreement. 
and investor state dispute arises in that context. It is also the reason why we have not been able to advance on investment protection with China, because we have discarded at EU level the old uh, ISDS system and replaced it uh, by an investment court system. China does not like that investment court system, but they are engaged in the negotiations which we are, you know, uh, 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 which we are uh, trying to lead uh, in UN Citral on a multilateral investment court. So we hope that on that basis, we would be able to come uh, to an agreement. China is interested in, uh, uh, China is interested in uh, negotiating investment protection with us. And hence this commitment in the agreement uh, to do our utmost to conclude these agreement uh, within uh, two years. Now, if you look at the content of the agreement, uh, it falls under the EU exclusive competence. The um, market access uh, offers uh, that we are still now uh, finally clearing with the member states, as always has to happen uh, in this process before we publish them in, in mid-February, uh, will not change that. They do not have an impact on the uh, on the nature of the agreement or on the on the competences uh, concerned. Um, yes, I think those were the questions. I was I was beginning to read through the questions and answers, but I, I stopped myself. <laughs> we will do that for you. Um, can I can I go back to uh, to Reinhard Butikofer? You, you've heard the reaction um, from from Sabina on, on several of the points uh, that you raised. Um, do you have any reaction to to theirs? <laughs> Well, I have a long time considered myself a hardcore realist in the German Greens. Might still be more idealistic than is the normal Brussels standard, but I certainly have not implied, nor have I hinted, that uh, this uh, investment agreement should have brought about free speech in China. Uh, I mentioned free speech in the context of um, the um, CSR um, provisions that are uh, to be found in the sustainability chapter. And I just made a very simple uh, remark that says, what does it really mean if they oblige a CCP controlled economy to play by CSR rules? on the, the, the Chinese reality. Uh, you can ignore these questions if you want, uh, but uh, I think uh, reality will not ignore them. Uh, as regards the um, um, provisions uh, on, uh, on forced labor, um, I would really hope that um, at some point a commission would start uh, uh, talking uh, realities and not just um, putting too much um, lipstick on the pig. This is a promise that entails much less than we should have had. And I give you the comparison of the uh, Vietnam FTA that the European Union agreed recently, where we have an implementation plan. This is missing here, but I, have heard what uh, Mrs. Vyant has said uh, about um, uh, the the European uh, her expectation that the European Parliament will use the time before um, uh, the deal is ready for um, consideration in the institutions, and indeed um, this is what we uh, intend to do. And and I. I can only reiterate in the strongest terms what she said. If China wants to have ratification, they cannot ignore the criticisms that have been voiced by the European Parliament several times. And the last time we, we put that in formal language was in the middle of December, when more than 600 MEPs voted in favor of strong uh, provisions and only 20 opposed. Um, indeed, I do also agree uh, with uh, Mrs. Vyant that this is this one deal is not um, the um, 
overarching um, EU-China policy tool. We certainly will have to invest in all the other tools that she mentioned. And uh, she said it in very polite terms, uh, expressing uh, hope that the um, uh, Portuguese presidency would pick up the uh, pick up the ball on IPI and, and and carry it forward towards the finish line. Uh, I could say that um, more directly, maybe she, than she can, but uh, it is a fact that the German presidency explicitly uh, put both feet feet on the brakes to prevent IPI from, from going forward in order to do China a favor. And this has me worrying that similar behavior impacting on our ability that we urgently need to unilaterally also take measures could be negatively impacted by uh, national governments, in particular uh, by Berlin. And we've seen Berlin dragging the feet on more than one front there. And uh, so uh, we need a very strong um, a push from the European Parliament and certainly from the European uh, Commission uh, to move in, a, in, another, in another direction. So one the second. fact that I'm critical of this does not mean I'm giving up or I'm, I'm saying uh, we've lost the battle. But uh, in order to win the battles that we need to, to win, uh, we should not um, paint too rosy a picture of where we are. Well, it's not a silver bullet uh, in this, this particular agreement. That is what uh, we can all agree to. Um, what struck me also in, uh, in your opening remarks, uh, Sabine, was that th there is an expectation, at least on the Commission side, on the EU uh, side in general, that China advances at least um, on um, its commitments on ILO conventions um, in the next two years. Um, why is there no rendezvous clause as regards um, the ILO conventions is, is one question that uh, comes up. Um, and the reference is made here to the fact that China agreed in the G20, uh, the anti-corruption ministerial track to show concrete progress by 2021 in criminalizing foreign bribery in line with the relevant uh, OECD conventions. Um, so on this issue, uh, first of all, um, I also use the Vietnam FTA as a reference point. And we use that also with China who said, but you're not offering us an FTA. And then we said, well, it doesn't matter. We will not be able to get anything else uh, through our authorizing environment, whether it's council or European parliament, which is the reason why we have exactly the same language as we have in the Vietnam agreement as regards forced labor, not as regards freedom of association. But we have exactly the same. So the roadmap that Mr. Bütikhofer referred to happened after the conclusion of the negotiation and was part of the preparation for ratification in the EU. That is exactly the process I referred to. So do not say that we are not meeting the standard of uh, the Vietnam FTA. And um, in terms of what we are doing here and a lot of observers, um, I mean, in the beginning, and I think Stephen referred to that, in the beginning, in the absence of a text, a lot was focused on was this the right moment, what is the message vis-a-vis -vis the Biden administration, etc. Now that we have published the text, I'm beginning to see a lot of serious analysis of the content, including observers who say that they are very surprised that China signed up to the transparency commitments and took the risk of exposing itself if there is no progress on these issues. So we have a dispute settlement on sustainable development, and we've used it with Korea. It took a very long time, but we have used it now. So we now know how to do that. Um, and we have this uh, process which allows amicus curiae briefs with a panel, the results of which are made public. And I think that is a strong incentive uh, for uh, uh, partners to an agreement to make sure that it doesn't come to dispute settlement. I can also confirm that China uh, is following very closely the debates in Europe, including in the European Parliament, which was one of the reasons why we could say, read for yourself, if you don't give us what we want here, what we need here, 
this agreement will not happen. So from that point of view, I think the transparency we, we have in the EU can also sometimes be useful uh, because they show uh, uh, our negotiating partners uh, what is possible and what isn't. Um, then there were quite, an, so in terms of the rendezvous clause, well, we have a rendezvous, uh, as I said, at the moment when we uh, present the agreement uh, for conclusion uh, and consent. So um, I think that is the moment when we are obviously uh, strongest uh, in order to uh, see whether there is, is, uh, is uh, progress. Um, I think that is what I wanted to reply to these questions. I see there's a lot of other questions uh, coming here, but I rely on Stephen to filter them. And, and my team. Um, Noah, you were one, one of uh, those who were quick to, to react, and you also pointed out, of course, the timing issue, um, perhaps better than, than any of us around this virtual table, so able to read the tea leaves of what's happening in uh, D.C. at the moment, uh, Biden administrations. There's a lot mer à boire uh, domestically, of course, um, so China might not feature, in the context with the EU uh, transatlantic relation, China might not feature uh, this week, uh, perhaps, but um, with Kurt Campbell coming in uh, as the Asia Tsar, um, one can one can expect a, a firm stance uh, on this respect. How do you think that after um, having read the text of the CHI, um, the calculation in the Biden administration may have changed? Well, um, sorry, I, I think to ask Noah in this in this context. Sorry. <laughs> Um, well, I, I think, uh, first of all, there isn't one uh, view within the Biden administration. I think there are different viewpoints. Uh, we're, I think we're still trying to figure out, um, uh, you know, and I think it's going to take the Biden administration time to figure out maybe half a year to, to put together uh, a China strategy. Um, but you're right, Kurt Campbell is a realist, he's experienced, um, he, uh, and, and if you look around the administration, Tony Blinken, Jake Sullivan, uh, Eli Ratner at the Pentagon, these are all people who are experienced uh, 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 foreign policy hands uh, and have had experience with uh, dealing with, with China. Um, I, I think that, um, I think this this came to a certain extent as a as, as a surprise. The fact that uh, the the fact that this deal I don't think anyone in Europe at the end of November thought this deal was going to come together, right? And a month later, it 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 did. Um, so I don't think it's the obviously these negotiations were, had been going on for seven years, uh, but it it was still a surprise to many, and I think. Uh, in the Biden camp, it, it, it was, you know, disheartening to a certain extent, but because, of course, Biden uh, came into his campaign, the foreign policy message was centered around uh, uh, reaching out to allies, repairing the transatlantic relationship, working together with allies, uh, uh, mainly on, on, the, on the China challenge. Um, but I think it was also perhaps a bit of a wake up for the people in the Biden administration that, you know, this isn't going to be a, a cakewalk. Um, that uh, you know, over the past four years, uh, Europe, but also uh, countries in the region, uh, in the Indo-Pacific, um, you know, have 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 shifted, and uh, they are smarting after four years of Trump, and uh, you know, they're looking out for their own own interests. So. Um, I, I think it, it, in a sense, it sent a message to the Biden team. This is this is not going to be uh, an easy uh, an easy task. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Noah. Um, I still wanted to to take a few questions. Just maybe read them up. They're, they're short, and then I will leave it uh, to any of the panelists, you know, to to react perhaps in in their closing statements. Um, Sharia Islam asks whether. Uh, does any EU connection in some form with the with RCEP uh, and the CPTPP being envisaged? Um, there is um, a question whether, and I guess this this harks back uh, a point that uh, Reinhard Butikofer also made in his uh, opening statement. 
is, is the CHI in fact limited in nature and only relevant for a small minority of European firms operating or seeking to operate in, uh, in China? His opening remarks um, referred to uh, the disadvantaged uh, position of SMEs in particular. There's a question on um, whether CHI uh, gives European financial service providers advantages compared to American counterparts in, uh, in China. And perhaps uh, the last one that, that, that we can take up uh, in, this, in this round, um, China has in the past made similar commitments to uh, state-owned enterprises behavior, commercial considerations, non-discriminatory treatment, industrial subsidy transparency, enforced uh, technology transfer. Um, what will the EU do if China's commitments in the CHI are not enforced, not implied. So with those questions, and I apologize uh, to those that, um, that have asked other questions, perhaps our speakers have been uh, able to, to spot those and want to lift one of them still out of, um, out of the Q&A box and, in, and weave them into their um, concluding statements. But as mentioned uh, before, we'll go in, in reverse order, so Noah. Um, well, I'm going to end on a positive note, just like I began. Um, I think the glass half full view on this is that we could see a reaction in Brussels and key member states, a sort of compensatory push to show that, uh, you know, as Sabina said, Kai is just one uh, a building block uh, in the EU's China strategy and that it does not define uh, EU-China relations. Um, I think we will see an embrace of transatlantic, a transatlantic discussion with the Biden administration. Um, it may take, might take, some while, uh, take a while to wrestle with some of these more complex issues around technology, but I think that discussion can happen in a way that it didn't happen uh, the past four years. Um, I think we could see uh, a greater push to demonstrate that Europe is serious about being a, uh, a geopolitical actor uh, on issues like connectivity, the Indo-Pacific. Um, anyone who read the recent foreign affairs piece by Kurt Campbell and Rush Doshi uh, knows that I think from the US side, cooperation in the Indo-Pacific region will be an absolute top priority. Um, and we could see robust use uh, of, of the EU's defensive toolbox. I think that's an open question. Uh, it, it's encouraging to hear Sabina uh, say that this is, uh, this is gonna, be, gonna be rolled out uh, as expected, despite the, uh, this agreement and the need to sell this agreement to the, to the European Parliament. Um, so whether it's legislation on subsidies, human rights sanctions, we talked about the uh, IPI, the procurement instrument, um, all these issues. So I, I think it's absolutely vital going forward for the EU to show that the deal will not get in the way of these policy tools. Uh, I think Europe needs to make clear that CHI is just one part of the broader strategy. So it's, it's encouraging to hear that. Thanks, Noah. Why not? Thanks. Three short remarks. First, uh, picking up on what Nod just said, I would be happy if the EU would indeed start using connectivity as another tool in its toolbox vis-a-vis -vis China, because China policy does have to include uh, our broader relationship with partners, uh, in particular Asian partners beyond China. Uh, that could be a very, very valuable addition. Second, uh, Regarding the question you asked about the difference between uh, multinational corporations and SMEs, um, I um, wanted to point out that in the context of the automotive sector, there is a provision that says uh, that uh, the market should be open for investment for, uh, in new energy vehicle um, uh, production. That is put under a certain conditionality unless you're able to invest more than 1 billion US dollars. That's what I uh, meant when I said uh, this could be a Gulliver goes to China mechanism because it could end up forcing 
uh, European OEMs to integrate much more intensely with the Chinese industrial ecosystem, rupturing the innovation partnership that has made it so strong in the in the past because of uh, uh, OEMs and, and uh, SME working together. And my last remark is I have heard um, the expectation from uh, Sabine Wyand uh, that uh, the European Parliament should contribute to making the glass more than half full. And I think we will uh, prove worthy of that trust. Very good. Um, Sabine, the final word is yours. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I think I will use it to try and answer some of the questions, notably how does Kai compare to the phase one? Um, I think we have to, in terms of uh, financial services, there was a specific question. In terms of market access, we are catching up with what the Americans got in phase one. Uh, but in addition, Kai contains regulatory provisions like access to payment and settlement, uh, self-regulatory bodies, etc., which level the playing field behind the border. So uh, I would say it's uh, it's phase on financial services. Kai is phase one plus. But then, most importantly, um, we are addressing state-owned enterprises, uh, and I've set out the provisions on that. And these are enforceable uh, through state-to-state -state dispute settlement, which, by the way, phase one doesn't have but it also doesn't have provisions on state-owned enterprises. So we now have, uh, in addition to what we could have done in the WTO and where we have not been very successful so far in challenging that, we have new, new instruments uh, to impose or, or police this competitive neutrality. And through we obviously... Sorry? Through arbitration, yes. after yes. the quasi-digital yes. settlement on, on political grounds. Yes, but I mean, we have a rapid reaction political mechanism and then we have a classical arbitration panel, which can lead to sanctions. So, you know, that is that is as policeable as commitments get. Um, we also have uh, subsidies for, uh, uh, on which um, the phase one deal has nothing. On forced technology transfer, we have more or less the same as phase one, but regrettably, um, the US administration, the Trump administration, used the leverage they had created with these illegal punitive tariffs on, on China and took that leverage and wasted it on purchasing commitments uh, for agricultural products, also uh, to the detriment of the, of the EU, um, uh, rather than addressing the systemic issues uh, which we need to address in order to make China's role on, in the global economy uh, more acceptable for others and, and avoid uh, or, or discipline the fallout of that. So from that point of view, the main difference is also, as I said, uh, that services market access is on an MFN basis. So I think we are really doing something here that uh, uh, makes a lot of sense. Does mm -hmm. this only benefit a minority of European firms? No, because you need to look at this in the context of global supply chains. Mm -hmm. China is a huge market we have huge investments there, but they also lead to economic activity uh, in Europe and around the world. And that is why it makes sense to make sure that these people who have invested or intend to invest in China can do so and are, are treated fairly. Um, and I think that uh, the agreement on half full, half empty, I think it is more than half full. Um, and I uh, am confident that as people wade through the texts, they will see the advantages. And please compare it also to RCEP, which has none of this, or TPPPP. And that is my last reply. We already have connections with most of the countries in uh, RCEP. Uh, RCEP itself is a shallow agreement and it has nothing on sustainable development and not very much on the regulatory side. So it's not a type of agreement we would ever be able to get through uh, council or, or parliament, uh, but we have our own agreements already in place and we are negotiating with others. Now, there are certain impediments to concluding these negotiations, but we are working uh, on these issues as well. And uh, we also have a strategic partnership with the ASEAN countries. And I think there is a lot of appetite in the Indo-Pacific region to also be able to diversify that is the same concern that the EU has. We need to diversify our relations uh, for resilience and stability. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Sabine Weyans, Rainer Butiko for uh, Noah Barkin. Glass half full or empty, I think what matters to us at SEPS is that we have an enhanced understanding of what's actually in the glass. And we will uh, certainly be um, tasting it in the next uh, few weeks in order to, uh, to, to draft our own uh, analysis on it. And we'll keep on following it. So thank you very much for this um, kickoff debate, I should perhaps then say on, on the CHI. I'm sure uh, we will return to it um, as negotiations uh, go on and, um, and the political fallout with that as well. So with that, thank you very much on behalf of um, the entire team at SEPS. Thank you very much to the speakers. Thank you very much to the audience. And we hope to see you and welcome you back soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.